questioning and doubting all existing beliefs. As adults, we build our lives upon a great edifice of beliefs. The beliefs can harm us, can harm others, or may give us comfort and others comfort too. And the beliefs may even be untrue. What is true for us may be untrue for someone else. Everything we know is a belief system, not the truth, not fact but a belief system, and it gets in the way of spiritual experience in a major way. And we can demonstrate this by taking the phrase sola scriptura, meaning by scripture alone. This phrase once only applied to the Bible and such ancient scriptures as the Vedas or the Quran, and it meant only the scriptures are true. I will live my life believing the scriptures and ignore anything that appears to contradict them. And before we condemn and criticize this view, we need to remember that at one time the scriptures were the only recorded version of ideas people had access to. Some history. Most of the scriptures we now regard as holy started life as verbal accounts, retold and retold around campfires thousands of years ago, and then recorded on clay tablets, papyrus, vellum, and on walls and columns as scriptures or friezes. The Bible, for example, is a mix of Chaldean, Babylonian, Assyrian, Phoenician, Egyptian, and other ancient civilizations' beliefs. Most of these civilizations lived over 5,000 years ago. As such, their beliefs will reflect the time in which they lived. Nine versions of the Mesopotamian flood story are known, for example, each more or less adapted from an earlier version. The version closest to the biblical story of Noah, as well as its most likely source, is that of Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh. As such, one can hypothesize that the stories in the Bible have a deeper meaning than a literal interpretation, and that it was intended that people understood the figurative message not the literal one. Our mistake has been to classify them as sacred, cast them in stone and take them literally. The story of Noah's Ark We have seen that one of the stories told in the Bible is that of Noah's Ark. It is a symbolic story but over the years it began to be taken literally. Andrew Dixon White The History of the Warfare of Science with Theology Some difficulties arose here and there as the zoology progressed and revealed ever-increasing numbers of species. But through the Middle Ages and indeed long after the Reformation, these difficulties were easily surmounted by making the Ark of Noah larger and larger and especially by holding that there had been a human error in regard to its measurement. And layered over this manipulation of a story to become more and more literal were the equally dangerous pronouncements of people who adapted stories in the belief the planet was made for man's benefit to do whatever he wanted. Andrew Dixon White continues... St. Augustine was especially exercised thereby. He says, 
I confess, I am ignorant why mice and frogs were created, or flies and worms. All creatures are either useful, hurtful, or superfluous to us. Luther, who followed St. Augustine in so many other matters, declined to follow him fully in this. To him, a fly was not merely superfluous, it was noxious, sent by the devil to vex him when reading. These are not the views of a spiritually advanced person, or an observant person, even a very bright person. A mouse, after all, is just a mouse. And I think a mouse may have had more to fear from Augustine than Augustine had to fear from the mouse. The spiritually advanced don't see anything from an egocentric point of view or a literal point of view. As such, these men had not even been called onto the spiritual path, but were stuck on the wheel of fortune, clinging on to the only belief they had because it was the foundation of their life. Men braver, more intelligent and more honest, stood firm against those who ignored the observed facts and continued, driven by the search for truth. Andrew Dixon White continues. Linnaeus, in his Systema Naturae, published in the middle of the 18th century, enumerated 4,000 species of animals. And the difficulties in bringing them together in the ark appeared to all thinking men more and more insurmountable. But what marks out those who let facts be facts and those who desperately try to ignore them because they threaten the set of beliefs they have is that eventually their whole belief system crumbles. Andrew Dixon White continues, This theological theory, therefore, had by the end of the 18th century gone to pieces. The wiser theologians waited. The unwise indulged in exhortations to root out the wicked heart of unbelief in denunciation of science falsely so called and in frantic declarations that the Bible is true. In other words, by clinging on to a clearly flawed set of beliefs, one can simply add even more errors that look ridiculous now, but may have seemed entirely plausible at the time. Andrew Dixon White continues. Dr. John Lightfoot, 1602 to 1675, Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge and one of the most eminent Hebrew scholars of his time, declared, as a result of his most profound and exhaustive study of the scriptures, that heaven and earth, center and circumference, were created altogether in the same instant, and clouds full of water, and that this work took place and man was created by the Trinity on October the 23rd, 4004 BC, at nine o'clock in the morning. Heresy Any opinion profoundly at odds with what is generally accepted is called a heresy. But just because 1,000 people believe an eye to, to be right does not make the one who does not wrong. Maybe he or she has new evidence and the 1,000 simply acquiesced to keep their jobs. Andrew Dixon White continues. We may well remember Darwin's remark on the stimulating effect of mistaken theories as compared with the sterilizing effect of mistaken observations. Mistaken observations lead men astray. Mistaken theories suggest true theories. The real sign of a sick society 
is when men or women are punished for having new theories with new observations to prove them. For example, beginning in the 12th century and continuing right up until the present day, the Inquisition conducted trials of suspected heretics and could sentence people to penances, execution or life imprisonment. And this is Palazzo del Sant'Ufficio, the seat of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the new name for the Inquisition. The last execution of the Inquisition was in Spain in 1826. This was the execution by garroting, seated strangulation of the schoolteacher Cayetana Ripal for teaching deism. Deism is a belief in the existence of a supreme being who does not intervene in the universe. Where men with different ideas today may be discredited, may lose their job, their reputation, their friends and colleagues, and may be ridiculed, even have to stand alone. They aren't burnt alive, using their own books as fuel, as Michael Servetus was when Calvin opposed him. Nor were they crushed into mental submission and fear as Descartes, shown here, was. Andrew Dixon White continues. Descartes seemed about to take the leadership of human thought. His theories gave a great impulse to investigation then, but his constant dread of persecution, both of Catholics and Protestants, led him steadily to veil his thoughts and even to suppress them. The execution of Giordano Bruno had occurred in his childhood and in the midst of his career he had watched the Galileo struggle in all its stages. He had seen his own works condemned by university after university under the direction of theologians and placed upon the Roman index. You need to be a very, very strong person indeed to be able to stand up against a mob, either literally or figuratively bang for your blood, even when you know you have the evidence. Because a mob is actually under greater threat than you are, as you are destroying the only knowledge they have. This may be ignorance, even willful ignorance, but remember they are not as bright as you are, and all you will eventually see is irrational emotion no use of reason and absolutely no evidence. Andrew Dixon White continues In France, Monseigneur Segur, referring to Darwin and his followers, went into hysterics and shrieked, These infamous doctrines have for their only support the most abject passions. Their father is pride, their mother impurity, their offspring revolutions, they come from hell and return thither, taking with them the gross creatures who blush not to proclaim and accept them. Scientific Errors The one thing that the Covid pandemic should have taught science is that everyone is different. Scientists continue to ignore the fundamental truth, and that is, we each have our own reality. See the video, Reality. You will never know what my experience of the combined input from my five senses is. There is no one reality. There are billions of experiences of reality and only the experiencer will ever know his or hers. Only the experiencer. It is man's tendency to look for a system, to try to classify and look for repeating cause and effect chains. 
but maybe the only cause effect chains we will ever really know are those we as humans build. And the only ones to produce a known effect from a given stimulus, the ones we program to do so. No scientist has taken the idea of control loops into their work. In all systems where the population is many and their workings different, a feedback mechanism must always be in place and be used. The need for a system is identified by the provider of the system. The system is then written if software or created if manufactured. The article or software then gets run, meaning it is tested by the manufacturer to see what the effects are. Then actual people, users are sold it or use it and the provider of the system starts to collect feedback from the users of all the indirect and possibly unwanted effects. The combined feedback from the users and any direct effects noticed are then analysed to find their cause, what went wrong and why, and changes to the system are made to correct it. And a new version is rolled out and the cycle is continuously repeated. And if something produces an unwanted effect, then the person with the system must find out why. And if it affects life, stop the system before catastrophic effects occur. And who better than Lucius Cecilius Fermianus Senior Lactentius around 250 to 325, an early Christian author, to provide us with an example? His advice on the Antipodes? Is there anyone so senseless as to believe that there are men whose footsteps are higher than their heads, that the crops and the trees grow downward, that the rains and snow and hail fall upwards towards the earth? I am at a loss what to say of those who, when they have once erred, steadily persevere in their folly and defend one vain thing by another. However, the missionary Jose de Acosta replied later, Whatsoever Lactantius saith, we that live now at Peru, and inhabit that part of the world which is opposite to Asia and the Antipodes, find not ourselves to be hanging in the air, our heads downward and our feet on high. Evidence is stronger than opinion. Overall Andrew Dixon White came to the conclusion that the actual problem in both theology and science was dogmatism. The tendency to lay down principles as undeniably true without consideration of evidence or the opinions of others. Dogmatism has shown itself in all ages to be the deadly foe not only of scientific inquiry but of the higher religious spirit itself. Whilst the love of truth for truth's sake has been the inspiration of all fruitful work in science. It is quite telling that there are 24 synonyms listed in the dictionary for dogmatism as if it is the norm, but the only word listed as the opposite is open-minded. Rare indeed. <laughs>